gotten started. <coughs> Benji, will you pray for us? Yes. Well, Lord, we do thank you, Father, for each other, Lord, for the body, Lord, that you have placed us in. I, for one, am am grateful, Lord, to be able to be with others who pursue, Lord, you and your ways. Lord, to be able to come together, Lord, and to work towards, Lord, a calling do continue to to ask, Lord, for your guidance, for your your direction, Lord, in ways, Lord, that we operate, Lord, that you would continue to enrich and deepen our relationships with one another, Lord, that you would help us to look beyond our natural abilities, Lord, to love one another and to seek, Lord, a higher way of doing relationship. Father, I pray for this time that, Lord, our hearts would be open, Lord, and willing to, Lord, even be used by you to to speak, Lord, and to hear from you. I pray for our dear brother Tim, Lord, that you would bless his words and Lord, even the spirit in which he carries himself, Lord, would you um, keep us, Lord, in the right state of mind, Lord, that we would be even, Lord, looking to honor you in the way that we preserve, Lord, our, our space, Lord, of mind. <laughs> Lord, that we wouldn't let ourselves get distracted be intentional in the way that we learn, Lord, and then be quick to to practice it, Lord. Thank you for this morning and for your love to us, Lord, in every way. We, Lord, are learning to to trust you and to uh, truly be able to, to know you as a father, Lord. So we thank you for that, Lord. And bless your name. Mm. Amen. Amen. Well, where are we? Where are we? <coughs> I think eleven twenty four. read the first section and then or did we already do 1124? Nope. Okay. Read the first section? Uh, yes. Somebody's going to have to look at these names. Mm-hmm. Yes, I don't know. Elijah, our super pronoun pronouncer is not here. What? How do you say it now? So, guys, I don't think it's really worth, like, really trying to do it the best you can because it actually ends up making me sound goofier. So just just try to, like, do your best as if it was an English word. And every time you see a Q, just pronounce it like a CH. Sound good? That's still an attempt. We're gonna have nobody's gonna remember that, so we'll have to. Yeah, but like we spend I get, I get that we don't have to more and more <laughs> time trying to like dance with names, but I think that's just kind of a waste of time. So G Zaran Zulu and Ran Chu oh. would be a fine way to pronounce those names. Okay. G Zaran asked, could could Zulu and Ran Tree be considered great ministers? The master replied. I thought you were going to ask about something exponential. 
ex ex exception. Oh, sorry. Ex exceptional individuals. But instead, he always asks about Zulu and Rem Chui, what we call sorry, what we call great ministers are those who seek to serve their Lord by means of the way, and who resign if unable to do so. Now Zulu and Rem Chui are what we might call <clears throat> use, useful ministers. Okay, Esther, next section. Zushan, how do you say that? Zushan? Zushan? Zushan. We'll just Means go with that. Literally, tool ministers. <clears throat> the gentleman is not a vessel. Confucius probably means to imply that Zulu and Ran Chui are minimally competent in carrying out the official duties required of them, but lack the moral vision of a great minister. As we see immediately below, Ji Ranzi apparently mistakes him to mean that Zulu and Ran Chui are tools that can be easily manipulated. Go ahead and read the next section too. Or the next little bit. Then, then they are the type who do what they are told. If it be, if it came to murdering their father and their lord, surely the, even they would not obey. Not too. Naomi. <coughs> and help with the names. Siren. Jesus Ren. Jizaren was the older brother of G. That says younger brother. Sorry, oh. younger brother of G. Kangzi. 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 The version of this passage found in the record of the historian has G. Kangzi himself as Confucius. Enter. What is that? Interlocutor. What is that? Someone who you're having a conversation with. Both Zulu and Ran Kui were serving as ministers for the Ji family and were clearly not displaying the sort of... of <coughs> scruples. Scruples expected of a great minister. <coughs> as the, rec the record of ritual explains, the ritual for the serving as a minister is not the... Remonstrated openly. If one is not heeded after three remonstrations, one is to resign the post. Han my Mayo Yong, I don't know how to say that. Interpretation of this exchange seems correct. Okay, Noah. The head of the Ji family was having the Yong Him sung at, in his in, ancestral temple and had eight rows of dancers in his courtyard, thereby usurping the administration of Lu, to the point that his own family matters and administration of Lu were conflated and viewed as one thing. As a youngster, how was Ziran to know that Lu had once had a legitimate lord? In taking Zulu and Ran Chu to be great ministers, he probably seriously viewed the G family and the Lu state to be one and the same. The master elucidated the duty of a great minister to him in order to make him see matters more clearly. And his putting down of Zulu and Ran Chu as mere useful ministers was specifically intended to restrain the G family as well. Ziran, however, misunderstands his intention, thinking that since the two disciples eat at his family, trough, they will follow his direction like trained hunting falcons or dogs. Therefore, the master further clarifies to him the great duties concerning lords and fathers in order to disabuse him of his notion. Thoughts? What's this about? <clears throat> It's 
a little broken up, so maybe we need to put it together, but any, any initial thoughts or comments? There's a little explanation of what is meant by useful ministers, that word that he used, and then that causes uh, Jizran to further his question, which is that second, or the you know, the third little part there. What's going on? Are you guys not at, not getting it or what? I'm not. Okay. I don't think I understand either. Okay. There's a little putting together, so. Um, <clears throat> Zulu and Renchu are ministers in this household. Jizran is one of the family members of this household. And... <clears throat> Not members of this household, I'm sorry. Servants in this household. The, the Zulu and... and uh, so what... No, are you aware of what service they play? Probably... That household is a kingdom, okay? So it's a, a ruling family, okay? So they're, the, they're lords and ministers in this context <clears throat> are those who would be a part of the council and the uh, the administration or the playing out of what is decided in a kingdom. So they're part of the decision making in, a, in that ruling order, if that makes sense. And this is done, you know, you have a, a family that is ruling. If my understanding is right, <coughs> Lu is the location or the area. Um, and so, not to be confused with a regular name. So, it had previously had uh, another family ruling. Um, and so, with previous family rulings or other dynasties, you would have had different ways of rule. They did things in a certain way. So, you have this young man in, in this household that is trying to figure out... Um, how these two ministers, that being Zulu and Ranchu, have how how do they how does how do they work? Are they great ministers? And so the first paragraph is probably the one that gives us the most information, not only about Confucius' view, but also about what he is trying to communicate with this young man. But you also have a level of youthful pride in this young man who's coming to Confucius to ask this question. But that is also tied to a pride that is assumed through the, the fact that he is part of this family dynasty, right? So you, kinda, you already know what you've got. And so he views them. He's wondering if what it means to be a great minister uh, is he's trying to figure out what that means. And so he is saying, I think it, it, the, the way that it's initially put, he says they will serve their Lord by means of the way and they will resign if they're unable to do so. So then he redefines them as useful ministers. And... He, de- he used that word, useful ministers, in order to shift the understanding of the person that was asking him the question. <clears throat> but he did not change how he would define what a useful minister or what a great minister would be. And so he says, well, it's one who serves in this way. And so he exposes then the way that this young man, Jesus Ron, thinks 
Because when he used that description of useful minister, then he was like, oh, basically they do whatever you tell them to do because you're the authority in the ruling house and they would do anything. So a great minister is one who would do anything that you tell them to do at any cost. And he, in essence, followed that. So that's, that's why he says in that follow-up comment, then they are the type who do what they told that's what he means by that. They'll do anything you tell them to do. Go John Papa Cliff. Okay, go kill that guy. Okay. You know, whatever the command may be. But Confucius gives correction to that as well. Well, if it came to murdering their father or their lord, surely even they would not obey. And so that is in reference back to what he had initially said, serve their lord by means of the way. And that connection has a lot to do with the way of honor in relationships. So those are the highest principles that cannot be broken. So, you know, in these types of ruling orders, if you were to disobey the order of a ruler, then it's like immediate death type of scenario. But... Uh, there is a pointing to a higher order there. I mean, that situation is not detailed here, but I mean, that's the type of type of rule. You know, you, you would never disobey. But see, that's, you know, these young, a young guy like um, Jizran is trying to figure all that stuff out. So, and then there's some other details in the last part, but that's that's kind of the basic picture of what's going on here. Noah, you have any insight, comments, corrections uh, to my understanding? Just up with like the context mm -hmm. of what's going on here. Um, basically, I don't know if we covered this in Emmanuel's class at all, but just to let you know like what's going on um, historically at this point, China is composed of like these states that were once unified under one emperor but um at this point there is like a um an a, a, an apparent emperor of the Zhao dynasty but he doesn't actually he doesn't actually have any uniting power so each state is uh actually kind of its own kingdom so it's like a splintered empire where you have states that are actually constantly battling against one another, which is why this period was actually called the Warring States period. And so there were like families that ruled each state, or at least a few states at a time, or at most a few states at a time. And this state of Lu, which is where Confucius lived most of his life, I think, was governed by a family called the Ji family. And Ji Tsuran is a young member of that family, okay? That governs the state that Confucius is living in. And so he's coming to Confucius and asking about two of his disciples, actually, who happen to be ministers to that same family. We've already looked at Zulu a few times, and Ren Chu is another disciple who, just for a little bit of background for him, he's actually considered to be a very problematic disciple. Confucius would often call him overly cautious or lazy. Um, so it's it's not surprising to see that the master would say something like, I thought you were going to ask about some exceptional individuals, which is kind of a... <laughs> it's a little bit of a date. It's, it's a little sharp on his yeah. disciples. But instead you always ask about Zulu and Ren Chu. So as Dad was saying, there is a difference that Confucius cut for this young man, Ji mm -hmm. Zeran about the difference between a great minister and a, a useful minister, Zhu Qin, which could also be translated tool minister, as it says. And due to this young man's uh, shallow understanding of the way that ministerhood worked uh, because of his experience with statehood and governance, um, he thought that when the master called his own disciples tool ministers or useful ministers, he was, he was talking about this, 
this kind of a, uh, uh, slave-like occupation in which you had people, like my dad was saying, that would do basically whatever you asked them to, kind of like robots. Like they, they, they don't really have any will or greater vision of their own when they, when they do serve their Lord. So the, uh, the, the responsibility and the fidelity is definitely there. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the more enlightened understanding of the way, which should be understood, I think Confucius is pointing at, as transcending the, the governing body or the, the person that's supposed to represent it. Uh, the understanding of that in such ministers isn't there. And so he's trying to cut that difference. He's basically saying that Zulu and Ran Chu do not have that greater understanding of the way. And so as such, they should not be considered great ministers. I'm actually really surprised that I didn't go into it in the commentary, but there are many um, instances in uh, previous dynasties, so before Confucius' time, where a ruler will begin to uh, depart from the way and the way that he manages the kingdom and the people. And such great ministers will do some very extravagant thing to, to show their discontent with the fact that the way is being departed from in the state that they are uh, a part of or that they're serving. So usually it would begin with that minister, and this would be an example of a great minister, trying to admonish the ruler to adhere to the way, or at least try to enable him to see that he's departing from it. And when he's not listened to, unfortunately I can't remember certain individuals' names, but there will be people that will, that there, there were two individuals at some point that went to the mountains and starved themselves to death in response to the emperor leaving the way. These are these are what would be considered the exemplary great ministers. They would they would do something that would really draw a lot of attention because of their faithfulness not to a person but to a way. Um, there are similar stories of of emperors that would do something very different. They would actually offer again. These are very. Uh, these are very legendary, very um, parabolic, but they would, they would actually come, the emperors would come to certain individuals and offer the kingdom to them. And uh, the, the minister's response to that would usually be to tie a millstone to themselves and cast themselves into the sea or into the river because they, there was something about what the emperor was doing the way that he was carrying that was not uh, truly representing the the way, the greater way, and so uh, these these legends would usually speak of a a very violent reaction to a departure from the way um, by individuals who were faithful even to the end of themselves or their own lives to it. So less dramatic responses to a departure from the way would be, I think it's actually discussed in the Analects, where you have ministers who uh, will either continue to serve faithfully and thereby become useful ministers and not great ministers, or they will depart from the uh, their role as ministers altogether when the rulership has departed from the way. Is this making sense? For the most part? Mm-hmm. And so there, there really was no uh, on what is I think somewhat evident here is that Zulu and Ren Chu made no uh they made no 
uh, like, they didn't really make any impactful or groundbreaking decision um, in response to the the uh, uh, faltering governance of the G family over the state of Lu. Because as we'll see in other analects, the G family was um, at, at most definitely departed from the way. They were not governing that state according to the way. And uh, the latter part of this commentary actually talks about how the young member of that family was seeing that state and that family as one thing, even though they were not to be seen as one thing. And so there's a lot of confusion as to um, what it means to properly govern and what it means to do so according to the way. And Confucius is working on clearing that up, interestingly, for one of the members of that family. Somebody has? No. FedEx coming through the window? Like that blue zone. So. <coughs> You guys are not receiving this, but I don't mean that in a direct criticism. It's because there's still a default mindset that you need to raise up to. This is all perspective that comes with a type of wisdom related to what it means to have the capacity and if God so so places any person <clears throat> in any position, but it's not about a position among men. In this instance, it is, but in the Lord's kingdom and in his ways, it doesn't have to be. But your mindset has to be the same, as though you are being trained to be one who will be in a family and within the context of that household, that family, it is a, there's a ruling order that is to be met out in the way that all things are done. So this is the, the type of conversation that, that, that this is. You're just going to check out of it. <clears throat> if you don't, it's not about like, oh, I'm supposed to be doing this in this way. And neither is it that we're making a, an observation of someone else. And whether they think is, it, whether the way that they think, uh, Jizaran, whether he thinks right or wrong. Well, clearly he thinks wrong. We can do that. We can say where, we can see where Confucius corrects him or uses the illustration of Zalu and Ran Tui as an example of how to be a great minister. <clears throat> so you might walk away today and say, or in, in today's time, you know, register something that says this is what it means to be a great minister, this is what it means, what it doesn't mean to be a great minister, or this is how you think foolishly as a young ruler in a household and you're, you know, you're corrected or whatever else. Or you might think, well, that's just Confucius giving us a, a higher way of thinking. But you may never think of yourself as someone being trained in the household of God to be those who think in such a way that you will be put it, you, you will be an administrator in a ruling word. And you don't need to contextualize that in terms of, oh, well, that means I'm going to be the president someday, or a king in another country someday, or the ruler of a city someday. That's not the right context to think of it either. And clearly, actually, what, what Confucius is referring to is a, a, a way of life that exhibits itself through a certain way of ruling. And it actually doesn't matter where you're at or what position that you have. Confucius was put in a place as a wise man and ultimately considered to be a sage and other things like we, uh, like we read about last week. But there are others who live the true essence of what a sage is out and they're never known. They're not a king. They're not a prince. They're not a ruler of a city.
that they, everything that was exhibited in their lives, the way that they thought about life, the way that they thought about relationships that they had with other people, the way that they thought about the responsibilities that were given to them, whether they were great or small, were all in the context of the outworking of a way of life that is a great ruling order. That's the nature of God's kingdom, and it rules that way. God's kingdom doesn't have to have a, a, a throne like men's thrones, a podium, a pedestal, or a pulpit to stand behind to speak to large audiences or nations at a time or through great venues online. The, the exhibition of that life is obvious in whatever place that it is put, high or low, seen or unseen by men. Because there's something that's been established in that person that views not themselves personally as an individual in their own little mission, <clears throat> but the perspective of their life fits into the context and the work, how that order works in life. That's a lesson that Confucius is has a hard time communicating to his own disciples. They still want to see how a gentleman works in the midst of certain scenarios that they create. But the true gentleman doesn't have a scenario that defines who he is. He just is who he is because of a higher order that exists. So it doesn't matter where he's placed. It doesn't matter what his dressings really are. And what he can convey to others through his positioning in life. It has to do with a settlement. And, and so if we were to go back to some of the, the introductions and in how certain things are defined and understood as it relates to the fundamentals of the Confucian way and what it is to be a ruler that is sent from above then these are things that are the natural outflow of your life. And every time, especially through this section of this little book where we see a lot of criticisms of characters, basically we're learning through what they did, how they thought wrong or what they did wrong, okay? Then, then we're learning through that. But the fundamental is the, the, the exposure of what in them was not the way. So it's not even about right or wrong as if right or wrong is black and white in that way. There are things that are. But the way is far more broad scope than that. And so those things are highlighted so that they can be used as an illustrative, a life illustration context of how people think or how a person is thinking short of what the, the greater aspect of the way is my point here is that you guys need to elevate your way of thinking you need to elevate the way that you view who you are and what your life is and the point is not to view yourself as somebody the point is to allow yourself to be opened up to a greater reality how that reality operates so that you won't feel like an outsider to this kind of conversation in your own mind, in your own heart. You wouldn't think, eh, I'll never be in that situation or this is just some strange happening in you know, a room in some household that was a ruling household somewhere and yeah, I can get the rights and wrongs out of it, but you don't really take into effect that, that everything that was being discussed here and the decisions that they make, they didn't make a, a, a decision here in this scenario. But the, the household is where decisions are made, and those decisions impact people, not just people that day, not the, the decision of the day, but the way it, it impacts their way of life. And that comes from the, the, the exemplary nature of what a ruling house is. So it's not, this, this is not something unique to Chinese culture or to any particular ethnic culture in the world. So rulers are put in a position and without them even, it is what they're there for, but they, there are still many rulers who think that they can live and do things in their life 
that are not consequential to the rest of the people that they rule over and represent. So, and in our government, that's a very different scenario because we actually supposedly choose the people that we set in place to rule. That was not necessarily the case in these scenarios. Those who had the most power, influence, money, or strength came in, in previous ruling orders in the world came to the, to the forefront. And there were some who ruled wisely and some who did not. But the way that they ruled was, it, it, it was like a personification of what was going to happen in that nation. Okay, so if we, you know, like, even in our nation, you know, 20 years ago or whatever it was, I don't remember, when we have, when we have someone that's in a consequential position like president, the, the role of the president, and the president is is not exhibiting moral behavior, okay? He's doing indecent things in his life that are not representative of what a good, wholesome life is. And he thinks that he is, it's not just about hiding what he's doing. It's that what I do in my personal life doesn't have that much of an impact on anyone else. This is my business my problem. But what happened when, when that happened, because there was some very explicit immoral things that took place during his time as a ruler or a leader of this nation that then became publicly known, and it was a huge slide for our country. Because... Everyone can look at that and go, ha ha, that guy is a leader, he made a mistake, we already knew that. Or they can say, well, that was, you know, this is the person that I voted for, and I thought he was a good leader. And what he did was wrong. But something inside of you shifts. Because something was made to be not that big of a deal. And that's the kind of influence that leadership has and that anyone who is positioned by God to be in a place of leadership has. In a, in a country like ours where there is some level of, of reciprocation and, and rec receiving and giving because we, and we, the people, are supposed to have some sort of influence on what kind of leader that we put up front, then it happens, it's like they work with it, with, and it's like this weird effect because what is in us that we don't see but is still brought out in the way that we choose certain leaders. So this happened to Israel as well, okay? And, and it happened with their first king, okay? And that obviously was Saul. And they put a man up there that was more representative of what they wanted and what they thought a leader should be. They already had a leader. They already had a king who was God. God was already looking to institute a, a different ruling order in their midst. And it wasn't in the same way that the kings of the earth ruled. He had already established his priesthood by that time okay and he said I will make you a nation not of kingly order and rule but of priestly or priest and kings so it's not that kingly wisdom wouldn't exist but it's that the operation of those two would be in the context of a spiritual rule but the other nations are not ruled that way and the Israelites what was in them by way of their desire, personally and corporately, was manifested in this first king, Saul, by their choosing. And even prior to their choosing of Saul, because even Saul's choice became this, uh, you know, kind of spiritual way of choosing something because they were casting by lot, right? First by tribe, and then within the family clans, and then ultimately, oh, well, there just happens to be this really tall, handsome, strong guy. Surely he's our leader. 
And when, when God went to choose David, he did everything the opposite. It wasn't what the people would choose. It wasn't even who the prophet Samuel, who was sent to anoint the next king, thought. Because every time one of the sons of Jesse was brought in, this Samuel thought to himself, surely this is the guy. And what God said unequivocally by having David out in a field, not even there, was, you don't even have a clue what I'm looking for. He's not any of this. So now that you've gone through your roster, then let me show you what I think. Wasn't even on your register. Wasn't on your radar. Wasn't on the radar of man. And then again and again throughout David's life, God said, this is a man after my own heart. And of my own choosing. Maybe. I just remember that um, one time I heard the, the, what David's father said about him. when he's like, he's like, do you have any other sons? And he's like, well, I've got the worthless one out in the field. Yeah, pretty much. He like, says like, the meaning of the words that he says is the worthless one. Yeah. Pretty much is like, well, and he would, you know, you, you guys, if, you, if you've read about David and studied his life a little bit, you know, you might not see him as someone so different from, you know, the way that Joseph's brothers perceived him. Mm-hmm. Well, there's that dreamer. He was just a little mama's boy. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Kind of like, he's never going to amount to anything. He kind of just lives in his own little world and he doesn't have the certain cares of life that we would think are necessary and he just kind of is we just let him do his own little useless thing. But see, in David's mind, what was going on? You know, with, my God, I can do anything. You know, he's out there role-playing almost in the field with the sheep. (laughs) You know, living a huge life. And it's like not even reality. Oh, my God, I I can take this bear. And he kills the bear, right? He does it. And I'm sure that everybody's like, you know, like, Okay, David, you know, and then it came to Goliath and it wasn't so different. (laughs) But see, he thought like a ruler. And that's one thing that's been, I I see is super unique about our brother Emmanuel as well, is that his whole life he has thought differently. And he hasn't lived in a, a dream world of fantasy. But his, the construct of his mind in perspective of how his life fits, what it's for, who it's for, what it's to be spent for, is very different than the average man. That's a higher calling, guys. And if there's one thing that our dear brother has always longed to continue to impart to all of us, is to to to, to elevate, it's not mental aspiration and spiritual attainment or, you know, becoming some wise person in your mind or others. It is about something far more fundamental in its essence. A life that's not your own. A life that can be used by and for a greater power and cause and and when we don't even allow our whole man to think of ourselves as even being able to be used in such way you're not going to ever be used that way if you think I can't or maybe I don't even want to be put in the context of what this in in that sense even the foolish thinking of Jizaran is greater than yours Because he's at least a member of a household of a ruling order. He recognizes it. He knows that there are responsibilities. And he knows that what he thinks will have an impact on others. But he he still thinks all wrong. But he has some greater level of understanding about the placement of his life and the consequential nature of who he is and what it will mean. A, a bad ruler, in this sense, can still have a, a, a higher mindset of their life than you do. 
Because your life, in many ways, is still just contained into what you think the next few months or years or next season of your life is going to be. Who you will be, what you will have for yourself, how that will feel, what you will be able to attain, what it means for you. That's a mold that has to be broken, guys. And I know this isn't the first discussion around this topic. But the, the way of the world is to, to crowd out a greater purpose in life. And it's always gonna, it's always gonna squeeze on you. It's always going to try to captivate your mind until you have really broken free from it. And you're, you're, you're at a very consequential age, season of age in your life where something's going to grasp your mind and your heart. And the only way for that to be changed later in life is through some extreme hardship in life. If at all. Otherwise, it's more like a loss. You're just one of the many. But if you are to be raised up as a son of Zion, a son in God's house, someone who knows and acts upon their relationship and of God's with the person of God and in the fulfillment of his will, That's the only people that will be able to be raised up against the sons of Greece who think and live in a whole nother way. The cultures of men, the restraints of man that have perpetuated through the ages. It is not a singular decision on your part to hear that type of truth, this type of truth, and just say, okay. I'll try and work on that. You have to really put the plot of the ground and apply daily discipline in the mind, in the heart, and before the Lord to, to, to so cultivate this soil that it can bear forth the fruit. Otherwise, the seeds that we sow will never break the soil. You have to prepare that ground. That's something that's done in the inner man, not just through the reception of topics and an observation of right and wrong. It's a very, very different mindset. If you can cultivate that mindset, then you will find that difficult truths Principles that have been very hard to understand will almost begin to blossom and flourish within you without your own knowledge. Mm -hmm. Not because you applied thought and brain power to them, but because you have cultivated something in the inner man that gives way for a different power of life to take effect. So it's not about your, per, your current placement or your imagination of what your future placement is. The placement in this function in God's house is not that type of positional placement. It is an appointment into a certain way of life where that life can function and then it will manifest no matter where you are, no matter who you're with, no matter what situation, no matter what season of life. That's the nature of the life of a true son. Mm -hmm. Not affected by other things. So there are, there are some correlations here, some parallels to the wisdom of the way, the way of the righteous leader that are conveyed in these writings the way of the gentleman, the way of the great minister, the way of that rep represent this way. 
is not going to be given to you through reading and discussion. Those may enhance. But there's, there's a, deeper, a deeper shift that's going to have to take place. Mm-hmm. And again, it's not the first time you've been encouraged along that line. So take the opportunity to realign your heart, your mind, to know what you're being trained for, into, what you're a part of, what household you are in, whose eye of scrutiny is on your life, to see whether or not you are seeing yourself in that way, and whether or not the way that you process things and make certain decisions in life is representative of one who is in that training. Any thoughts, Benji? <clears throat> well, um, I definitely felt the, the pressure of the Lord in the last few days. Hmm. Just in something like what you're saying with even just the way I think of myself. That's something that's been uh, even prophesied over my life is Mm. a a big hindrance for just the Lord to be able to to break through Mm. on certain things. Um, And even just like the way that you give your uh, self to the Lord, like on a daily basis, can be so falsely mm. <laughs> misrepresented. Um, where you're still in control. Mm. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's going on. I'm just like. Mm. too much to say but the Lord is so willing to give to us mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. it's just a matter of our hearts mm. and our willingness to receive it mm-hmm. I've seen it in the last few days mm. still rejected it. I don't know how. Hmm. I really don't want it. Yeah. Well, the Lord's obviously working that in you, Benji. Mm -hmm. He knows what's in the deeper parts of your heart, even the areas that you can't see into. And he's very obviously working in that place. I pray that that would be the case with each one of you doesn't mean that it has to be expressed in the same way that it is with Benji, but guys, God is more than willing, and he has set you apart. It is not my intention, Emmanuel's intention, intention, anyone else's, to try and make you think of yourself in a way that is higher than you should. But we cannot set aside what God has shown us, what your generation is to be. And that's not about plumping up your image of yourself. It it, it is about trying to enable you to get into, to posture yourself to the place where you can actually receive an impartation from a former generation in whom God has done something so that this can be worked out in you. I 
the time of impartation is not just upon us as if it's just arriving. We are in the middle of it. And I, I have a concern that only a few will be able to receive it. It's not my judgment. It'll break my heart for anyone who can't. But I don't have that. I don't have the, the, the power of that choice. And it's not just a choice on your own. So as to be put in a moment of decision and say, oh, okay, well, I'll do it. Much deeper than that. Something in the inner man that responds to something in God. You need to deeply, deeply wrestle with these things. And that's not coming from someone who doesn't love and care for you. It's someone who very much loves and cares for each one of you. But my, and even our brother Emmanuel, his, his offering cannot go further than, than that essential agreement and initiation between you and the Lord. So it's not just your choice, like, oh, okay, I'll do it. Because you were somehow brought to that awareness. Something beyond that. It's more like a realization that you, that you are something that you didn't even choose to be. And so you're willing to fulfill. Then it is something that you want to be. Or are willing to be. That's more like the recognition of a, an appointed type of relationship that you had no choice over. You weren't obliged to it, obligated to it. You didn't choose it. No one forced you into it. But a real inner realization that that is what it is. And that that is who you are. And therefore, and thereby, what you are for and to become. That's a different realm. It's, not, it's outside the realm of man's choice. Man's preference. His imaginations. His hopes. It's deeper than all of those things. All those things are nothing in this realm of placement and position. And it is in that place that divine impartation can happen. Benji, why don't you pray for us? I'm, Asking you to do that because the Spirit of the Lord is obviously on you. Not only because of tears, but because of a, a, a move in the inner man. So, bless us. Pray what the Lord has on your heart. If you guys put your hands on Benji.
Yes, Lord. I pray that, Lord, your spirit would lay heavy on your people. Mm. That Lord, we would realize what's been given mm-hmm. and what lays before, Lord. And Lord, that you would give us strength to ascend, Lord, your mountain. Mm-hmm. Lord, that the trial and the struggle will be a joyful thing to us, even. Lord, that you would give us vision, Lord, to see indeed the greater purpose, Lord, of your your love towards us. Your desire for relationship Lord I do pray Lord that we would be very vigilant Lord and aware of the ways that your way can be misinterpreted and twisted, Mm -hmm. Lord, that we would be on high alert to, and be quick to reject, Lord, those things, Mm -hmm. even though they are comfortable, and they do, Lord, keep us in a place where we don't need to move ahead. Lord, we we thank you for your work and for your willingness, Lord, to to offer such a a high way, Lord, to us. Indeed, it's a process and a a struggle is more the the life of the flesh continues to be stripped away and Lord your your reality is Lord the new dwelling Father, I pray that you would bring us true settlement, Mm -hmm. true peace, Lord. May we even seek to not define things with our own knowledge anymore, Lord. But we would look for your definition, Lord, and for, Lord, the way that you have set things in place. Lord, may we count each thing as your work, Lord. Be receptive, Lord, and full of a kingly joy. Father, we we thank you for this good work. Mm -hmm. Lord, in the midst of a rotting world, Mm -hmm. we bless you, Lord. We trust you with our dear brother, Mm -hmm. Emmanuel. We know that, Lord, 
time on earth is what a, this life on earth is a mere vapor Lord to what is eternal Lord we have seen even the power that you have revealed through Lord, this situation this season in life we pray for his life Lord mm -hmm. session. <laughs> mm -hmm.